Hello, hello. Uh, welcome to the final week of content. Uh, we're just going to finish with the last few slides for computational linguistics that we didn't get to last week. And then we'll jump straight into forensic linguistics where we'll talk about some legal stuff, some uh, murder related stuff and how linguists can be used in the court of law. And then at the very end of that, we'll go over the test three guide and everything you need to know about next week and how the last week in the course is going to look. Um, because basically this is the final lecture and we'll just talk about that at the end. Okay, so uh, the assignment is due tonight. So you've already taken a little bit of look at uh, Duolingo and uh, which is essentially a computer assisted language learning program. So now that you've taken a look at it, we can kind of talk about, you know, what goes on in computer assisted language learning. And the nice thing about the assignment problem is that it was more exploratory in nature. So you didn't really have to know much about it and you could kind of go into it with fresh eyes. So what computational linguists who work with call, so call is short for computer assisted language learning. Uh, what they focus on are ways that um, can help students and people learn language. So they ask questions like, what are the best ways to help users retain their knowledge, which is just a very big issue with any sort of app for language learning. Um, how can we give people feedback, specifically with pronunciation and grammar? Uh, how can we tailor feedback to individual people? Because depending on how complex a program is, feedback can either be very general, like, uh, you've made this error, so let's give you some generic feedback that goes to everybody. So, for example, uh, with Canvas, this is the only type of feedback that you can give automatically. So, if someone answers a question incorrectly, uh, we have the option of putting in, like, some message that goes out. If you answer a question incorrectly, we can give you a generic statement, but that statement goes out to everybody who gets it incorrect and we cannot modify it based on how you answer. If we wanna give you tailored feedback, we have to manually type it in, which is what you know we do on tests and assignments. But if the program is advanced enough and written well enough, uh, you can actually have a computer give tailored feedback specific to individuals automatically. So uh, let's take a look at some examples of a couple different systems. So the current focus is of course on trying to get individual feedback and trying to incorporate the internet and things into it. So uh, there's two really popular programs that are used right now. Um, one is incredibly nerdy and it's great. Uh, the other is like a simple flashcard program. So uh, if you've tried to learn vocabulary in another language or trying to learn characters in another language, you might have heard of Anki. So this is an incredible flashcard program and it's free if you use the web version. It's paid if you wanna get it on uh, iOS, it's free on Android, but it lets you put audio into your slides or into your flashcards. It puts video into your flashcards, images, um, files. You can link to websites, you can link to whatever you want, you can create incredibly powerful flashcards. So any sort of mnemonics, any sort of ideas you want in your flashcard, you can do with Anki. Uh, you can even do like step by step. So if you want to study for a biology course and you want like fill in the blanks where you um, check like piece by piece, uh, you can do that as well. So Anki is, is a great tool for flashcards and it utilizes something called a spaced repetition system. So it also incorporates some psychology in there. So it knows when to show you the flashcard again to optimize your learning. So uh, a bit of computational implementations with some psychological research to make a really effective flashcard program. So this is much more beneficial than taking like a napkin or a flashcard or something, writing something on one side, writing an answer on another and just flipping back and forth. You know, you can have a computer do it for you, and you're not wasting money on paper, and you can edit them at any time. Uh, a really cool implementation are these like virtual worlds. So something like VR chat. Uh, 
VR chat is sometimes used for, you know, other stuff, but there are communities that use it for language learning and for some of the more knowledgeable aspects of life. So you can like put on a VR headset or just download it on your computer, get a little avatar for yourself. Usually it's anime girls, um, but you know, you can be other things too. And you can interact with other people in the real world. So you can practice language, you can talk about whatever. Um, so you can use a computer world to immerse yourself in some other environment. So you could actually go to a world that someone's created that um, looks like whatever culture you're going for. If someone puts in that kind of work and you can talk in another language and you can practice and you can sort of get that immersion that you don't get in the real world. It's not going to be perfect, um, but it does give you that sense of immersion that you can't get, say, in like uh, Alabama if you're trying to learn, say, I don't know, Greek or Japanese or Chinese or Russian. So that's a little bit more focused on the human to human interaction rather than human to computer, but it's still an application that computational linguists can work with. So these systems aren't like intelligent systems. Um, they're not systems that are looking at individual people and making adjustments for you. These are just systems that users can use and you sort of modify yourself. It's your responsibility to use them in a way that's effective. But there's this new wave of computer-assisted language learning called iCall, which is intelligent computer-assisted language learning. And this uses artificial intelligence, so AI, with computer-assisted language learning in order to give individualized specialized feedback so what this does is let's say you're given some grammar questions and or or let's say you have to write a short paragraph it will take your input so you can give it a paragraph and it will analyze that paragraph for you and it will parse it using all the part of speech tagging it'll figure out the sentence structure that you have and it will find errors. And based on the errors it finds, it will then provide feedback to you and say, um, in either intelligently, if it's designed to say, these are the problem points you have, or it will come up with new questions and examples that target those weaknesses. So these systems are essentially smart enough to determine what you got wrong and develop new questions and examples to help you correct those systems. So this is sort of like the new age of computer assisted language learning. And this is basically like having a personal tutor, but you can't really talk about other things. It's very impersonal because they don't have personalities, um, but you know, they help with the learning aspect. So there's just a little image on the right that sort of shows how this works. Uh, this is like, a screen that you interact with, uh, you supply it with an input. There's this like analysis aspect here where it's doing a bunch of stuff with your sentences and your grammar, and then it provides some feedback to you and it's like a little loop. So kind of like the grammar checking sites like Grammarly. Um, yeah, so I've only used the free version of Grammarly before. I don't know how advanced the advanced version of Grammarly is, the, the paid version. Uh, so I know that the free version checks your grammar and makes recommendations. Um, I don't know if the advanced version like says, here's what you've been making errors on, here's some recommendations to improve. Uh, I don't know if, if that's what it does. Um, but if Grammarly were an intelligent system, like I call, what it would do is it would take a look at all your errors and it would say then, okay, here's what you've been doing. You've been making mistakes with commas. So what we're going to do is we're going to provide you with some more examples and some questions and say, okay, where are the commas good? Which sentences have good commas? Which sentences have bad commas? Where should the commas be? To give you some more practice. And it would just automatically detect this and provide it to you. That would be like an intelligent system. 
So it's an intelligent system is like having a personal teacher just monitoring you at all times. And whenever they find something that's going wrong, they sort of butt in and say, okay, here's some questions that we're going to fix. Uh, have some practice. Okay, uh, you've got it. Let's, let's move on. Let's try some more stuff. Okay, you're good. Let's just keep going. And if we find anything else that's wrong, we'll give you some more practice. So that's sort of the difference between call and I call. Call is like, you need to figure it out. Um, here's some general feedback. It's your responsibility to learn stuff on your own and find your weaknesses and improve on them. While I call is like, you just do what you need to do and we'll help you when we find that you're making mistakes. So um, you've probably all seen the Duolingo question and worked with it a little bit. So if you think about what Duolingo is, um, when you make mistakes with Duolingo, I don't know if you made any mistakes with Duolingo because the first lesson was pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. I mean, and the, um, the types of questions they give you too in the first example, it's like really just click the picture, uh, click the words. You're not really doing anything too creative, um, but Duolingo is not, much of an intelligent system, at least with the free version. And I don't really know if it gets intelligent later. It's not really about personalized feedback. Uh, there is somewhat of an intelligent aspect when you get really deep into Duolingo and you have done a lot of problems and they say, okay, um, you've made mistakes with these words and these sentences, so we're gonna do a review and we're gonna target these weaknesses. There's that intelligent aspect of it. Um, but that's about it. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about uh, call in the computational linguistics lecture. Are there any questions about that? Okay, so let's take a look at today's stuff then. Forensic linguistics. So forensic linguistics is all about language in law. So this starts from uh, as soon as you have suspects for anything or as soon as you're in a trial and there's some sort of case, Forensic linguists can be called in uh, either as lawyers, some linguists work as lawyers, or they can be consultants. So you can have a linguist who works in the speech science, uh, speech sciences, or just uh, expert linguists who are researchers at universities. They can be called in for cases uh, to give input. Now, uh, linguists can be used for different purposes. So we're going to talk about those different purposes and Instead of just having a bunch of terms and stuff in this lecture, I thought it's the final week, it's forensic linguistics, let's just talk about a few different case studies and um, we'll make that about half the lecture and then the other half will just be some generic facts and some examples. So we'll do a lot more applied stuff this time. So some of the things we'll talk about today are like what areas of linguistics do forensic linguists need to know about. So sort of all the stuff we talked about in the course is going to come back. Um, how do forensic phoneticians deal with voices and like what do ear witnesses do like are ear witnesses effective like when someone's blindfolded and they hear the voice of someone how accurate are people's recollections of those voices and how do they test for that uh, when you have ransom notes that are written how do you determine who wrote the ransom note? Uh, and in a much nicer case, let's say you have a book that's written by somebody and you wanna determine if that book was written by a certain author, if it was like under a pen name or if it was a book that was claimed to be written by a famous author, but maybe it wasn't. Uh, how do you know if it was actually written by the author or not? And the last one, because it's university, 
uh, I feel like I might be giving tips for how to like skirt around plagiarism, but hey, we'll talk about it. Uh, how, how is plagiarism detected? Uh, how do you how do you avoid getting caught for that? That's sort of what's going to be there. <laughs> what type of linguist would help make software that checks and compares written signatures? Um, if you're making software, you're in the field of computational linguistics. If you're being consulted, you might just be with the research. Uh, just you might just be a research linguist in, in any field. Um, but usually, if you're in software production, you're a computational linguist. In fact, if you're checking and comparing written signatures, you might not even need to know anything about linguistics at all. You could probably get away just by knowing computing science and filling in some details about linguistics when necessary, to be honest, because it's more about understanding um, writing patterns rather than anything to do with language. Okay, so let's talk about what forensic linguists need to know in the realm of morphology and phonetics. But let's take a look at case studies. And the first question to you is, what do you think of when you hear these following words? McCinema, McPrisons, McSurgery, McThrift Motor Inn. <laughs> the, the word McSurgery and McPrisons to me is just so funny. Um, but I bring these up because these are real names of real things. Uh, that don't have a relationship to McDonald's. But uh, these are important because there was a case uh, a, a while ago, like a few decades ago, um, where McDonald's went to court over company names like McThrift Motor Inn and basically argued that nobody else can use the prefix mick. So this is a case about morphology because this is about the fact that you can own a prefix legally. And in response to this, uh, there were linguists hire, hired to basically show that Actually, McDonald's does not own Mick because Mick has been used in the past with other products. So things like Mick Cinema, this has been used. Mick Prisons has been used. Mick Surgery has been used. Mick Thrift Motor Inn has been used. So, so owned legally. Uh, I think I think it was uh, this lawsuit was in U.S. in the U.S. Yeah. So linguists were able to show in court that Mick was not owned exclusively by McDonald's and that actually over 50 other companies have used Mick in their company names. So McDonald's should not have the rights to control Mick. So linguists basically proved like, okay, um, that is not exclusively yours. However, uh, McDonald's basically contested this and said, well, even though other companies have used it. If we think about trademarks, it's actually about what people think in the public when they hear Mick. So they ran marketing studies and they took people and said, okay, when you hear these words, Mick Cinema, Mick Prisons, Mick Surgery, and you hear these other companies, what do you think of? And people said McDonald's. And because the marketing research said that, okay, when people hear Mick, they think of McDonald's, the court said, well, the Mick prefix is already established in people's minds as meaning McDonald's. Therefore, the Mick prefix is actually owned by McDonald's now. So this is one of those cases where even though linguists have proven that the Mick prefix is used by other companies, the courts ruled in case of McDonald's because the general public believes that Mick is McDonald's and not other companies. So um, a case where linguistic science and our understanding of language did not succeed in the court of law. Kind of a sad story, but uh, sometimes money wins. So linguists are often employed in cases where you might have to argue about the ownership of morphemes. So 
another case that has been talked about in the past and one that you see in many other companies is like, for instance, in the word Jackson. So for instance, the morpheme sun in Jackson. What if you think about this morpheme sun? Should sun be something that is owned or not? And in the case of sun, uh, this one cannot be owned because it is in simply way too many company names and there's not a single person or there's not a wide group of people out there who associate Sun with any particular company, which is different than Mick. Uh, what about Mick or Mac prefix schools and universities? Uh, I think because Mick for schools and universities are not products, it's okay. Um, it, it's a little bit different in the court of law when they're arguing for product sales or some sort of retail. So the argument was for, for product sales in this case. And I don't think Mac MAC counts. It's very strictly Mick MC. What about the names of people? Macmillan's Bakery. Uh, this is a good question. I'm not quite sure about that. So I haven't read the full details of this case. I mean, these are like legal cases. So I'm not a forensic linguist. I don't understand all the details. I understand sort of the summaries and cliff notes of these. So um, I'd have to look, of course, into the full details and understand the full details. Again, there's a lot of legal language. To become a forensic linguist, you need a lot of training in criminology as well for legal language. So I'm not going to pretend I'm an expert in this stuff. I, I know uh, the high-level basics. Uh, in terms of phonetics, uh, linguists are also called upon when it comes to sounds in company names. So whether two products are similar enough phonetically. So there is this case in the UK for these like slime products. So I'm sure you've seen like the, the sparkly little slime products that people play with. These were very popular about 10 years ago. And there were two different products. There was Guck and Gak. So Guck is this a vowel. Gak is this a vowel. If we take a look at where these are in the mouth. Um, so this, sorry, this, this is like the front of the, of the mouth where you speak. Uh, your nose is there. This is like the back of the mouth. So a is down here and a uh is about right here. So they're pretty close to each other. Sorry, let me move that there. So those two sounds. And they're both selling the same product, Guck and Gak. So of course, this could be problematic because one company is going to say they are both copying the product and the name to try to steal customers because a, a kid goes to their parent and says, mom, I saw a commercial for Guck, get me Guck. And then the mom goes to the store and buys Gak. Well, that could be stealing some money that shouldn't have been stolen, right? So they go to court and they say, one of these companies needs to change so linguists come in and they say, well, actually, these vowels are sufficiently distinct enough that this is not an issue. So in one case, uh, it was argued that these are different enough that Guck and Gak can be their own companies, and this is not a problem. Now, this case is problematic. Um, there have been a lot of forensic linguists who have chimed in after the fact and have said that actually uh, these are similar enough that this case should not have been won and that one of these companies should have had to change their name because a and a uh are pretty similar in terms of the vowel space, that they're close enough in the mouth that people could confuse them depending on their first language and how they interpret the sounds. So forensic linguists do need to know a little bit about how vowels work if they're being called on for a vowel case. 
So, I mean, you can imagine like the difference between a, a, a someone arguing for this case who doesn't know about sounds versus someone who does know about sounds, someone who's arguing for letters versus someone who's arguing for the actual space in the mouth and how it's being pronounced. Uh, these are two different arguments that people can make. Uh, one is like, how are people perceiving it versus how are people reading it? Um, here's sort of an interesting case with syntax, so with sentence structure. And I'm sure whenever you've signed up for any product, you've seen the terms of agreement. You've seen the, the EULA and you've looked at it for about two seconds and then you've scrolled down and you've hit I accept and then you hit okay and you haven't read it and the one time you've tried to read it you've made it a couple paragraphs in and then you've read a couple sentences that have been relatively confusing to understand and then you said okay screw it and then you just hit accept um, that's just how life works so about 30 years ago uh, of course, if you're in business, always, always read it. It's very important you read it. This is how you get screwed over. <laughs> read everything. Um, there is a case where even though something was read and even though the terms were accepted to, uh, there was a case in court where it was argued that the terms were too confusing due to how complex the sentence structure was. So I, I took the sentence that was quoted in the case out for you, and I've sort of highlighted the part that's confusing. Um, so the amount of AFDC assistance received to you, which you were not entitled, will be recouped from future AFDC payments or must be paid back if your AFDC is canceled. So we don't need to really get into what all these different terms are. But the problem with complexity here is that received to you is talking about assistance and which you were not entitled uh, is also talking about assistance. So we have these things called relative clauses here and they're both pointing back to the same word and you have a negation inside one of the relative clauses, which makes it a little bit harder to parse. And this is already inside this giant sentence, which is a condition that is within a conjunction of two different conditions. And this information is also in an either or statement, which has another conditional inside of that. So we don't need to talk about what these things mean, but what we need to know is that there are a lot of clauses in here. There's a lot of like sentences within this giant sentence that make this a very difficult sentence to interpret. And here are the specific things that they said. There's seven clauses, there's six passive verbs without subjects, so the subjects have to be inferred or at least figured out. And the compound and abstract nouns, which contain nominalized verbs, uh, this is just sort of a fancy way of saying that um, the verbs are acting as nouns here. So the result of this case was never reported, so we don't know if they succeeded or not. Uh, the implication. Uh, the implication is that this argument failed. Usually if it's not reported, it means that it didn't succeed. Um, but I think the argument is, is understandable here. The, the, the terms should be rewritten in a way that is easier to understand. But the counter argument is this is why you have lawyers who specialize in legal language. This is why you have lawyers who look at this kind of stuff and can make sense of it. So probably TOSs are complicated legal pieces, so it's hard to read and it's ambiguous. So yeah, so this is probably intentional. 
the way that it's written. And this is why you should always have lawyers or someone who specializes in language to make sure that the terms are clear, especially when there's a lot of money involved. Um, but the main point of this example that I want to say is that um, linguists can also be employed in cases where uh, the, the structure of what's being understood and the ambiguities uh, in the terms uh, need to be made clear. So linguists can analyze the sentence structures. So although uh, Levi in this case, and this is this is the name of a person, not a company, not the company Levi, this is the person Levi. Um, although Levi is a linguist and can analyze what the sentence means, uh, the whole point of this was it's too complex for the people who accepted the terms to understand. Here's an interesting case of word meaning. So sometimes uh, when there's a word in a case, linguists might be employed to argue for the definition of a word. So here's a case in 1993 about the words accident, disease, and syndrome. So this is about life insurance, accidental life insurance. So there was a kid who died from sudden infant death syndrome. So the key word here is the word syndrome. The, 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 we can't say illness, we can't say disease for this. It is very clearly the child died from sudden infant death syndrome and the parents made a claim for accident and life insurance. So accident and life insurance. So this type of life insurance pays out only when death occurs by accident. So out of the person's control, it does not cover disease and illness. So if you have pneumonia and you die from, from pneumonia after a month, this would not pay out because pneumonia is, is an illness. So life insurance refused it because sudden infant death syndrome, the life insurance claimed that this was a disease. So it does not cover diseases, it did not pay out. So what the linguist did was they demonstrated that actually the word syndrome in sudden infant death syndrome is not a disease, it's not an illness. It is something different, it's an accident. So the life insurance has to pay out. So they showed that one, Professionals do not consider it a disease. Doctors would say, no, this is not a disease. It's not an illness. So that's step one. And step two, they had to argue for definitions. So they had to clearly define disease and they had to clearly define syndrome. So this is sort of a nice, concise way of putting it. So they said that disease is a temporarily bound state between health and death. And the idea is that at some point, you either recover from it, or you die. You eventually go one direction or the other. You're in a state, and then it's one or the other. At some point, it, it changes. While a syndrome, on the other hand, is different. A syndrome is not temporary. It's something that if you're healthy, you either have or you don't have. There's no change once you have it. So therefore, a syndrome, when you die from a syndrome, it is accidental. It's closer to an accident than something that is a disease. And this case was won uh, by McMenamin. So the insurance company did pay out in the end for the death of the child because it was proven in court that a syndrome is an accident rather than a disease, which is non-accidental to the life insurance company. So forensic linguists can be used to argue word meaning as well. I mean, and this is, this is a big deal, right? If you have a child who has died and you're expecting some money from that, because this is 
very helpful money for, I mean, not only you have to get over the cost or sorry, the, not the cost, the, um, the, the, well, the mental cost, the, the tragedy of losing a child to a syndrome, um, but also to help with that, you have your life insurance that you've been paying into as well. So uh, these forensic linguists, they, they use for phonology, or sorry, phonetics, morphology, syntax, semantics with word meaning, all these different areas of linguistics, forensic linguistics, or forensic linguists uh, can be called to court to help with. So all the things that we talked about back in that lecture three just keep coming back. Um, this, this one isn't a case study, but this is an experiment, which is uh, quite interesting about how people remember things. So this is about discourse memory. And when you think about the word discourse, uh, just think about the word conversation. So how people remember conversations. And this relates to phone calls or talks between people. So it's a fact that when we remember conversations, we do not remember conversations word for word. There are a lot of things that we omit. We omit uh, discourse markers. So we forget things like, um, we forget words like, yeah, and well, um, I mean, words like that. And we remember usually the content, but we don't remember it word for word. We sort of just remember the ideas. So we remember ideas and when we reconstruct it, we just reconstruct the conversations based on the ideas we remember. And maybe based on the personality of the people that we know, we might put it back in their language. So to test how well people can recall conversations verbatim, so meaning we want you to listen to a conversation and we want you to tell us exactly what was said word for word. Uh, Burton and Coulthard, so two linguists, conducted an experiment to see whether participants could do this, recall conversations verbatim immediately after hearing that phone call. So no time in between, just you listen to the phone call and then you put down the phone or you put down the speaker and then you just write it out word for word what was said. So on the left, we have the actual conversation line by line. And then we just have two examples of participants and what they said. So we don't need to go line by line of what happened but we can see the differences of what the subjects remembered versus what the actual conversation said. And remember, there's like a 30 second difference between them hearing this conversation and them writing it down. So the first line, where were the meetings? This is fantastic. Every subject got it. Uh, but the response, there was a meeting at King's Cross. Yep. And there was a meeting at Chesterfield. Uh, subject one combined the two. So subject two remembered, or sorry, subject one remembered the details, but didn't get it verbatim, they, they put the details together into one line. Uh, subject two completely forgot about King's Cross and just put Chesterfield there. Uh, when the person asked where these night meetings or day meetings, um, both people forgot that they asked night or day, they just thought that they were asking about night meetings. And in the response, um, the real conversation said no, they was during the day. So this is interesting. There was a grammatical error in that last sentence. They was during the day, but nobody remembered that in the recollection. Uh, instead, they paraphrased it. No, during the day and B for subject two, mainly at night, yeah. They didn't even get the information correct. So this is really important information for court. Because when you ask witnesses to write down and remember what they heard on the phone call 
a week after it happened. There is no way they are going to remember word for word what the person on the phone said. No way. When you run experiments and people cannot remember 30 seconds later, word for word, what was said on the phone. So the main takeaway that forensic linguists have found is that when you have non-recorded telephone calls, and you're just getting these witnesses that are reporting what's being said, uh, these should not be taken as substantial evidence. Uh, it's basically hearsay at this point. And hearsay meaning uh, it's just like a person's point of view. It shouldn't really hold much weight in the court of law if it's not recorded. So kind of an interesting fact, and this is why it's always good if you're in a province or country where you can record calls that are important, you should always record your calls and always have a trace of any transaction that you're doing in business. Um, especially, this is why whenever you do something with over email, always make sure you have an email record, do not delete your emails. I only say this because these are things that I do. And eventually, at some point in your life, it might be helpful to have a record for something that you do. Whether it's academia, whether it's in business, uh, whether it's for legal purposes, it's always good to keep records of things. Your memory is not as trustworthy as you think it is. Okay. So that's some discourse stuff. Uh, one last thing which is really interesting is understanding the differences in culture. So specifically, we'll talk about responding to questions um, because this is something that we don't always consider. And this is just something that many people are not necessarily aware about until they're told. So when you respond to questions or when you have interactions, uh, well, when you have interactions, I think we all know that different groups of people interact in different ways. Um, but responding to questions is not universal. So in Western society, typically when you ask someone a question, you expect an immediate response, or at least you expect them to make some noise. And when they respond immediately, that means that there's some truth. Like... For instance, if you say to your partner, do you love me? And they pause for five seconds before saying yes. You're going to be like, uh, excuse me, why did you wait five seconds to respond to me? Like, do you not know immediately that you love me? <laughs> uh, it might feel a little bit uncomfortable. But in some communities... So say in some indigenous communities, pausing doesn't raise suspicions, but rather it indicates that the person answering the question is considering it, that they find the question important and that they're taking the time to think about it. So that pausing isn't a bad thing. It's a good thing. It's respectful. So in court or in a police interview, like when a police officer is interviewing someone and they're taking five, 10 seconds before answering a question, that isn't something to be suspicious about if you know their cultural background. Instead, it's something that you should say, okay, they're taking the time, so this means they're probably being truthful. Compared to say an English speaker born and raised in Canada, if they're taking five seconds, then a police officer should be like, okay, this is weird. Why don't they know the answer right away? So taking a person's cultural background into consideration is important. Uh, there's this interesting concept as well that comes in called uh, gratuitous concurrence. And if you've ever been in a case where other people speak a language and you don't, um, this is something that you've probably done unconsciously. And that's if you're asked a question, sometimes if you don't understand the question, or if you just didn't catch it, you'll respond yes. Even if you don't actually agree with the question 
or if you don't know what's being said, you'll just say yes. Uh, and this can really screw you over in law. If a police officer asks you something and you don't understand the question or you don't agree with it, you should not say yes, because that yes will forever be on record and that evidence can be used against you. But in some cultures and with some people, they do say yes. And this is called gratuitous concurrence, is when you just say yes out of habit, um, out of misunderstanding, out of confusion. And non-native speakers of a language will say that more often than native speakers. So this doesn't matter what environment you're in. If you're a non-native speaker in that environment, you are more likely to say yes, uh, just out of confusion and do this gratuitous concurrence. And this can cause some conflict uh, in, in courts of law because they'll say, well, you said yes when I interviewed you, but why are you saying no now? It's like, well, I didn't understand the question. Well, what do you mean you didn't understand the question? You said yes. So yeah, in confirmation of hearing what is said, like, like nodding. Yeah, sometimes yes is just a confirmation like I heard you. And that's how people use language. So um, yeah, this is called gratuitous concurrence. Okay, so this is what forensic linguists can be called for. Uh, phonetics, morphology, syntax, semantics with word meaning, uh, differences in culture, and discourse memory or conversation memory. All these different aspects, how linguists can be consulted to make sure that uh, things are being treated properly in court. So yeah, a linguist might actually be called in to a, a court thing to say, well, is this a case of gratuitous concurrence? Uh, what what are the cultural backgrounds of these people? Is this something normal? Um, maybe there's some interactions before that have been recorded that they can analyze to see if this has happened. And in some cases, we get lucky and there are, or I shouldn't say we get lucky, they get lucky and there are recorded conversations where this has happened before and they can prove that this is gratuitous concurrence. Are there any questions about this stuff so far? Okay, I'll do one slide and then we'll do a break. So we're gonna jump over to forensic phonetics. So forensic phonetics, uh, phonetics are people who specialize specifically in speech science and analyzing audio and dealing with audio. So uh, at SFU, we have a course in forensic phonetics. Unfortunately, it's just at the 400 level. So um, it's not <laughs> a course that uh, is open really for electives. It's really just for linguistics majors or cognitive science majors who take linguistics. Um, well, we have a, a professor who deals with um, understanding, interpreting, and rating accents and analyzing speech. So um, speech scientists or forensic phoneticians will help police forces with these things called voice lineups. And I'm sure you've seen movies where they bring in a bunch of suspects and they have someone behind one of those one-way mirrors and they point to a suspect and they say, that's the person who came in and stole something from my house. And, you know, those are the lineups where people come in and they point based on the appearance. Uh, voice lineups are similar, but instead of a bunch of people, they use voices. So they take the recording of the suspect's voice and then they hire a linguist to find similar voices, like similar in terms of pitch and intensity and form and frequency, so how the vowels are produced, to see whether the witness, which we call an ear witness because it's how they listen to them, to see whether they can identify the person that they actually heard. Uh, and what this test is for, much like identifying who the person in the lineup is, uh, is to see if they're actually a good ear witness or not. Because usually uh, with the voice recording, I mean, th they know it's, it's not about who the suspect is because they don't necessarily know who the suspect is. 
It's more so about does the participant recognize the voice because they have the recording and that's all they have. So they need to know if the participant, if, if the person who heard the voice is able to recognize it. And uh, this is an important task because when people listen to voices and when people listen to messages, people don't actively listen all the time. It's, it's, a, passive, it's a passive task. They listen to the content of the message, like I said before, they reconstruct it. And the voice reconstruction comes with it too. If the content is more aggressive, the voice reconstruction in their head might be more aggressive. If the content is more passive or has grammatical mistakes, the reconstruction might be a little bit different in their mind. So we need to test, they need to test to see if the person who was listening to the voice was actively listening and has a good recollection or not. Uh, so ear witnesses are a thing and they can do lineups by calling in a speech scientist to find similar voices uh, to see how well the ear witness actually remembers the voice of the person who uh, did whatever. Usually these are audio calls for like, um, instead of having a ransom note on a piece of paper, they might have a ransom phone call, for example. So anyways, we're going to take a 10 minute break. Um, in the 10 minute break, I'm going to play a uh, forensic linguistic case for you. And uh, after the 10 minutes, we'll come back and talk a little bit more about forensic phonetics and some authorship attribution. So I will see you then. If, if, if there's a next break, we'll continue that because that is really interesting stuff. I mean, he sounds incredibly bored, but <laughs> the content is good. Okay, so there's, there's a little bit of language in this slide, but um, this is just another important thing that forensic phoneticians do, and this, this comes back to a little bit of psycholinguistics. So this is important information. Um, priming is a big deal in law as well. So there's a case with David Bain. I'm sure if you listen to... Um, crime podcast you've heard of a couple of the people that we'll talk about in in some of the worst cases today uh so david bain was a murderer he killed his parents and siblings in 1994 there was an audio recording with some barely audible audio which means that it was some audio where you can't really understand what's being said um, the, the word, you cannot make out the words. If you listen to it, you just cannot make them out. But the police claim that they heard David Bain, the murderer, say, I shot the prick under his breath. So because the police claim that they could hear this, the prosecutors were like, okay, he said this, so this is a confession. Um, so this was in 1994. So he, he, he was charged with this. Now, like 17 years later, a, a study was run about this case to see if uh, people actually heard this. So 200 participants were asked, knowing nothing about the case, just listen to the audio file and tell me what you hear. And the majority of people either said that they didn't hear any words at all, or they heard the words, I can't breathe, for whatever reason. We don't know why they said this. Maybe uh, some audio artifacts sounded like these words. But nobody out of 200 people said that they heard the words, I shot the prick. So 200 people, no, nobody heard that confession that the police said that they heard. So that original confession that they heard was obviously a lot of bias into it and probably not justified. And by probably not, I really mean definitely not. So a follow-up said, well, okay, so what's happening here? Because if the police say they hear it, a jury has to agree. It's not the police saying it and then suddenly the judge is like, okay. 
uh, the jury has to agree. So why would the jury agree to saying that they heard it as well? That's a good question. Because if the audio doesn't really make any sense, then why would jury members say that they hear the same thing? So in a follow-up experiment, they divided people up into two groups, uh, group A and group B. And what they did was for group A, they told them just about the case. So just a general, general information about the case. But for group B, they told them about the case and they also told the participants that the audio was alleged to say, I shot the prick. So they also told B what they thought the audio said. So what happened with the people reporting what they heard in the experiment was in group A, nobody heard, I shot the prick. Nobody, but they did hear words like gun or kill. That's what they heard because they were told about the case. So they were listening for words like gun or kill. And some people reported that. But in group B, many, many people reported hearing I shot the prick. Now, this is interesting because the only way that they ever reported hearing those words is when they were told what the audio was said, what the audio was alleged to say in advance. So priming uh, comes back in this case. By telling people what to hear, people heard that from audio that doesn't really have any meaning to it. So this is how in 1994, uh, the police were able to get David Bain convicted of murder um, by just getting the jury to agree with them for what they heard, even though the audio really didn't say that. So uh, knowing a context will affect what you hear. Here's another interesting difference in pronunciation that can lead uh, to a case. Uh, let's talk about the words can and can't in Canadian English and American English. And this isn't a general difference across all Canadians and Americans. This does vary from person to person, but we'll talk about what some people have. And this is something that I have so I can actually demonstrate this. Um, Let's say these sentences out loud quickly and let's listen to the words can and can't. I can go a little later today. I can't go out later today. I can go a little. I can't go out. I can go. I can't go. So some Canadian and American speakers do not pronounce the T in can't when they speak quickly. Uh, in fact, the two words sound almost identical, can and can't, in fast speech. So for me, there's a little bit of a difference between the vowel, can and can't, can and can't, uh, but the end of the word is very similar. There's just no T. Uh, but some speakers don't even have a difference in the vowel. It's just, I, I can't go, I can't go. It's, it's the exact same vowel. So this came up uh, with a case study um, with a doctor where a doctor was prescribing medics, uh, medicine to a drug addict. And the doctor was reported saying, you can inject those things to a drug addict. Now, this is not something that you should say to a drug addict if you're a doctor and you're giving them medication that is supposed to be taken in some way. Um, so the doctor was reported saying you can inject those things and the doctor was persecuted for it originally. 
the defense claimed that he actually said you can't inject those things but because the doctor was speaking quickly as a north american doctor you cannot distinguish those two words because the t is not pronounced um uh, this argument originally did not fly the police were like no he clearly said can the t was not pronounced but a forensic speech scientist came in did an acoustic analysis with spectrographs that we saw last week and showed that by looking at the formant frequencies and how the little bars line up that actually the remnant of the t was there and the vowels for can't were different than the vowel for can and that was able to save him and prove that the doctor said can't rather than can so uh, this is probably something that you might not have considered before that these two words sound the same uh, but this this is a big big deal uh, well you can imagine how big of a deal it is in court if this is a real case that has happened before so a linguist was able to save a doctor from persecution by analyzing his words for can versus can't. So not, not everybody will do this. Of course, it depends on first language background and all that kind of stuff. Um, but this is a pattern you hear. And this is also why if you're someone who's learning English as a second language, you might get confused sometimes when you hear someone say, you can't do that. And you might hear can and you're wondering, why they're saying the wrong thing it's because some people pronounce can and can't exactly the same uh, forensic linguists also do something called speaker profiling which uh, is interesting because in sociolinguistics, it's something we kind of discourage doing, uh, but forensic phoneticians uh, do it um, not to pinpoint a person down. So, okay, so what speaker profiling is, is when you have an audio file of someone, it's to take an audio file and basically determine physical properties of the person. So their sex or gender, their age, um, their ethnicity, where they're from, what their first language is, and so on. Now, uh, some things are a lot more reliable than others, of course, like determining someone's ethnicity from their voice it is, is very hit or miss. It's, it's, it's not as accurate to say determining someone's sex. So um, the purpose of speaker profiling, again, is not to pinpoint down to like one person uh, what speaker profiling is used for is to take like a large pool of people that it could be and just to narrow down the pool a little bit so let's say there could be a hundred possible suspects speaker profiling is used to maybe narrow it down to like 25 or 20 and just to eliminate some people so there was a study done in 2012 that showed that speaker profiling can identify a speaker's region just by a voice, so where someone lives in the world, with an accuracy of 85%, with most errors being like one region away. So for example, uh, let's say I'm in BC, right? 85% of the time, someone could identify that I'm in BC. And if they're making errors, they might say I'm from like Alberta or from like Seattle or something. So they, they would get a pretty close guess based on how I talk through speaker profiling. That's because different regions, people talk in different ways. Okay, so uh, here's some of the things that speaker profiling is really good at. So it's really good with determining sex. And that's because we know frequencies. Uh, for instance, we know that men have frequencies between 60 to 180 hertz. And we know that women have frequencies between 160 to 300 hertz. And this is determined by the length of the vocal tract. So this is like a biological property. Uh, women have shorter vocal tracts than men. So that the difference in pitch uh, comes out biologically. So by analyzing the pitch, we can 
pretty accurately guess if it's a if it's a man or a woman biologically. Um, it becomes difficult though if people use a pitch shifter. So if people mask their voice by using an audio program. So if you pitch your shift down to be like say 30 hertz, it might be a little bit more difficult to tell if you're a man or a woman because you've changed the audio file. So sometimes there are programs you can use to reverse those effects uh, if someone doesn't do a good job at masking it, but if someone knows how to play with the values and the things, uh, they can do a pretty good job at masking it. And by masking, I mean uh, covering up their, their properties of their voice. So uh, age isn't usually too good, um, but you can use sort of the words that they use and the speech patterns to figure it out. So if someone is talking about yeeting a body into a river rather than tossing a body into a river, uh, they're probably younger if they're yeeting it. If they're tossing it, they might be a little bit older. Uh, if they have any sort of speech disorders, it's going to be a real giveaway. And you can talk about, like, you can bring in a clinical linguist or a speech pathologist to help identify that kind of stuff. Um, but in terms of, like, ethnicity, uh, it's not going to be too helpful. Uh, first language patterns can be useful because you can analyze some of the speech sounds, like if someone is pronouncing THs as Ss, like um, instead of saying this, they're saying like uh, this, then they're probably not, say, a native English speaker, and that can be used to help narrow down the pool. So we don't, uh, they don't use speaker profiling as conclusive evidence to say this is for sure the person. They just use speaker profiling to sort of narrow down the pool of suspects. And to say, like, it's probably not this person. Um, the actual tool that's used to analyze a speaker's voice uh, does actually compare a spectrograph. So like there's a, the, the graphs themselves, you're not going to analyze these because it's just too hard to take a look. I'm just trying to illustrate a couple things. Um, so uh, let's say you have an audio file of a sentence that someone has said. So here's like an audio file. This is like evidence from the actual case. And then you have a suspect. And what you do is you get the suspect to record a similar line to what's on the audio file. And uh, even if someone puts on an accent, you'd get them to repeat it a lot of different times and get a lot of different instances of it. So that way, eventually they tire out or you'd have them read paragraphs and sneak the lines in there. So that way they don't know when it's coming up and eventually it would just, uh, when people put on an accent, if they're not a trained actor, it gives up eventually. So you can get the two sentences compared side by side and you can compare the sounds to see uh, are they making the same sounds? Are their vowels in the same place? Uh, because people pronounce vowels pretty consistently. And you can compare and say, okay, um, are these the same people? So uh, we don't need like a, a strong phonetic background to take a look at these. I've sort of pointed out some of the differences here. So uh, if we take a look at where the is in these lines, so let me just sort of put where the starts. So the is sort of this bracket here, while the down here is this bracket here. Uh, we have a lot more darkness in the the up top, while a lot less darkness in the the down below. So these are likely different speakers. If we just take a look at the patterns of darkness for these vowels at the end here in the word train, uh, the patterns are very different for how the vowels are being done. So uh, we don't really need to know too much, but we can tell these are different speakers just by taking a look at their spectrographs. So this is a nice scientific way of comparing two people's voices. And with this, we don't need to worry about things like pitch or loudness. So whether someone has a high pitched voice or a low pitched voice, or if they speak loudly or quietly, we can ignore that stuff. 
what we're looking at here are just like what vowels are they using um where in the mouth are the vowels being made uh, what are what consonants are they pronouncing so all the stuff that people like to manipulate to make their voice seem different we're ignoring that stuff and we're just focusing on where the tongue is in the mouth the stuff that is a lot harder for people to manipulate when they're trying to pretend to be someone else um so yeah if you want to get away with murder changing the pitch of your voice and how loud you talk is not a good way to do it because it's very easy to ignore that stuff and look at what consonants you use where your tongue is in your mouth when you're making vowels and so on please don't become murderers after this course because eventually it will be tied back to me thank you Okay, so that's it for forensic phonetics. Are there any questions about what forensic phoneticians do? Okay, uh, let's talk about authorship attribution. And authorship attribution is, is a nice general term that covers identifying authors. And this can be identifying authors of books or of you know ransom notes. So good stuff and bad stuff. Uh, this section, I, in terms of like the public, I think, was reintroduced with this book called The Cuckoo's Calling. Uh, there is this new author, uh, Robert Galbraith, who became very popular very fast. He was a new author. And computational linguists were like, hold on a second. <laughs> this, this is weird. Normally new authors aren't this popular this fast. And also some of the writing in this book is pretty similar to other works that we've seen. So what computational linguists was they took this book, The Cuckoo's Calling, and they took books written by famous authors in the same genre, so uh, crime fiction. Uh, they also took other popular authors like JK Rowling and other authors of the time. And they took the books and they used machine learning to compare them, to see some matches. Like how common are the sentence structures? How common are the words? And what they determined was that this book, The Cuckoo's Calling, shared a lot of similarities with the style of J.K. Rowling. So this means um, things like word choice, sentence choice, um, how, how paragraphs are split up and so on. So, so there's some actual writing stuff involved that's beyond just language that computers can pick up when uh, it's doing machine learning. So when I mean machine learning, I mean just a bunch of like really abstract stuff that, com that humans don't understand, but computers just uh, take features and figure things out. So uh, by comparing this work with a bunch of other works, they were able to determine that actually Robert Galbraith was just a pen name for J.K. Rowling. She wanted to try out a new genre, but she didn't want to put her name on it. Um, and it was actually written by her. Why did they look into this? Did they think there was something fraud-like going on because new author was so popular so fast? Uh, it's not really fraud-like. It's just sometimes when a new author is very popular very quickly, um, some people notice some patterns or they wonder, hey, is this actually a pen name or is this someone new? So this, uh, this sort of task is not a difficult task for someone who does computational linguistics. Uh, this is a very fast task that can be done. If you take a graduate course or an undergraduate course in computational linguistics, uh, you could put this together in less than an hour and you could test this yourself. So uh, for someone who's interested, they, they could run this and figure this out. And I think that's just what happened. Someone was just interested and they found that this was the case, that Robert Galbraith was 
new book was actually written by J.K. Rowling. I'm not sure 100%, but this is just my guess with what happened. Uh, I would look into it for sure. But um, theoretically, uh, this, this is something that would be very easy for them to do if they wanted to. So out of hobby, they could, they could just check this out. So um, these types of things can be used for like murders and suspects and suicide notes. So let's actually take a look at a case. But before the case, we should probably talk about something like sentence structure, just to get an idea of some of the differences that we can see. So this is called forensic stylistics. And when we talked about style, I don't actually, when we talk about register, for instance, register is about how we talk in certain situations. Style is about the certain structures that we choose to use. And styles relate to idiolects. So remember, idiolect is how we talk. This is our own personal way of talking. So our idiolects have a style to them. So for example, if we have, say, a verb like give or send, a, a verb like send, this is called a ditransitive verb. Um, what this means is that there are three people or things in the sentence. Like there's someone doing the sending, there's something being sent, and there's someone who is receiving that thing. And there's three different ways that we can phrase these sentences. One of them is a little bit older sounding, but we can say, for instance, I sent John my will, I sent my will to John, or I sent to John my will. And th this last one is is a little bit older. Not too many people say this um, out loud. It's more of a written thing. So we have our own preferences for when we speak and when we write about which one that we use. And we don't just pick one. We pick and we use different ones in different circumstances. Sometimes it's random, sometimes it's particular. Um, but we'll use multiple ones. And what's important is that we're consistent. So we have like a distribution and this will depend on a person and you'd have to write a bunch of stuff and analyze it. But let's say within a person, I might use the first one 37% uh, of the time and I might use the other one 63% uh, of the time and I never use the last one. So maybe this is me uh, and maybe you are someone who uses the first one 80% of the time, the other one 20% of the time, and the last one you never use. So uh, maybe that's how you are. Okay, so this is your own style. So everyone is consistent within themselves. So we can use this information about a person to help figure out who the author of a certain text is. And if you're really good at figuring out like how to be someone else and masking yourself and acting, you might be able to adjust your style and change it. Um, but it's never just one thing that gives you away. It's never just like, oh, it's how you use ditransitive verbs that give you away, or oh, it's whether you use the word yeet or toss that gives you away. It's like the collection of all the different things you do that makes your idiolect yours. And so you have a bunch of different things you do, and you're probably not aware of them. So whether you change one or two things in your own idiolect, that's probably not going to hide your appearance. So you're writing as you're writing. Um, so let's take a look at an actual case now. So here is the case of John Benet Ramsey. I'm sure if you you're into crime, you you've heard this name. So John Benet Ramsey murdered a six-year-old in 1996, and he left a ransom note. Um, 
But the ransom note was cleverly written. Well, I say cleverly written, kind of, um, because it basically framed the parents um, until the ransom note was analyzed. So uh, the parents were the suspects for this murder of the child. So I've written an excerpt from the ransom note, and I've just highlighted some words here. So I'll read this out to you. Uh, we are a group of individuals that represent a small foreign faction. We represent your business, but not the country that it servers. At this time, we have your daughter in our possession. She is safe and unharmed. And if you want her to see 1997, you must follow our instructions to the letter. You will withdraw. Uh, the S with the two lines is the dollar sign. So specifically, this represents this one, not that one. So that's that, that's the that's this one, uh, not not. Uh, let me do a different color, not that one. Um, you'll withdraw one hundred eighteen thousand from your account. A hundred thousand will be a hundred dollar bills, and the remaining eighteen thousand is in twenty dollar bills. That distinction is important. Okay, so. They analyzed the parents' writing. Now, it's really nice because the parents had writing samples because they worked in business, so they had other things that they could analyze. And what they noticed is that, first of all, these words are misspelled, business, possession, and unharmed. Uh, now, these could be things that, you know, maybe the parents did intentionally if they murdered the child, um, but also the dollar signs were quite important because neither of the parents ever used dollar signs written with the two lines, they wrote dollar signs with one line consistently. So based on the analysis of these notes, so it's not just the words, it's also the sentence structure. Um, it's also the fact that we have the, do the decimals here and nowhere else. But uh, just to point out the stuff that we can understand at this stage uh, without needing a lot of syntax, um, they were able to confirm based off these that the parents were not the ones who wrote the ransom note. So the parents were cleared from this murder because the style was not the same. So, like, it's not just, again, it's not just one thing here. It's not like, oh, it's just one word that was spelled differently. It's not just like one dollar sign that's changed. It's, it's a few things that are happening here. Um, the double S on business, the one S on possession, the un on unharmed being a separate morpheme. So you have a morpheme change here. Uh, you have a, a dollar sign here. So that's a symbol difference. Uh, I'm not quite sure about sentence structure precisely because we don't have a, a we don't actually have another person's writing here to compare it with on the screen. Um, but uh, sometimes there are word choices as well too, like small foreign faction. Maybe the word faction isn't something that the adults would typically use. Uh, is there some kind of online software tool to do voice pro voice piling voice profiling so I can see how my voice would be perceived, like online spectrography? Uh, you can download the program Pratt, which is free software. Um, it's very small. You can record a file and you can analyze the spectrograph there, but I don't think there's anything that online that you can just do in a browser. Uh, it's just one file, and when you're done with it, you can delete it. It's Pratt, P-R-A-A-T, in chat. That's what I demonstrated with last lecture. I downloaded it for the lecture and I deleted it after because I'm not a phonetician, so I don't use it too often, but it's like 30 megabytes or something. Okay, um, so that's one case. I wanna show you um, another one, but just some more information about that same one, uh, about the John Bonet Ramsey case and just some general comments. Uh, so people have variance in their writing, but there's consistency. Um, and within, say, like a domain of people, 
So let's say we're looking at authors, for example, and we're looking at comedy writers. Within the group of comedy writers, we don't expect two comedy writers that are popular to have the same style. But if we take a look at all the authors in the world, yeah, we might have a couple authors that have exactly the same style. So, um, you know, the more we limit our domain, the more variance we're likely to see. So it's important to take a look at like the relative frequencies for, of different styles between different authors. So when I said things with like pattern one and pattern two with like say 30%, 70% for like one person and 70%, 30% for the other, that's like taking a look at how much you use one structure versus the other, that's important. Um, sometimes people misspell words, but the misspellings are consistent. So if someone's going to make a mistake, uh, let's say you make a mistake, I don't know, 5% uh, of the time. Because sometimes even if we know how to spell a word, we still make a mistake. But when we make that mistake, we'll make the same mistake. If I'm going to misspell business with two S's at the beginning, then I will always make that mistake if that's the mistake I'm going to make. I'm not gonna suddenly make one S at the end. Uh, because, you know, it's the same error that we're going to have in our mind. Um, and the last point about, yeah, in that domain, like say you're looking at horror authors, horror, horror authors, um, you're never going to have two horror authors that have the exact same style that are popular. It's very unlikely. And if you did, you, you might get some plagiarism. Uh, accusations there. Okay, uh, let's take another look at another authorship attribution case with um, a murder. Here's another murder. So here's the case of Jenny Nickel. Um, so Jenny Nickel was taken out. Uh, she disappeared. After her disappearance, she sent some texts from her phone. So she disappeared and then she sent, from, she sent some texts. And I have two texts written on the screen, the first text she sent and the last text that she sent. And the texts were written in a way that was basically like, hey, I've just, I've just had too much in my life. I need to leave. That's how it was written. Um, and the question that came up was, were these texts actually written by her or was she murdered first? And then the texts were written by the murderer who made it seem like Jenny Nickel wrote those texts on her own. So what forensic linguists did in this case was they took a look at some variables and by variables, we mean like different syntactic constructions like or phrases or words and saw how the suspected murderer usually writes them and how Jenny Nickel, the person who was murdered, usually writes them. So um, Nickel here is the one who was murdered and David Hodgson is the one who is the suspect. So I won't so, okay, let me read the text. So text one is, thought you were grassing me up, might be in trouble with me dad, told mom I was living, didn't give a shit, been to Keswick camp and was great, have to go see ya. The last text was, she got me into shit, it's her fault, not mine, blame for everything, I'm sorry, okay, just had two eyes, she's a bitch, no food in, always searching me room, eating me sweets, have to go, okay, I'm very sorry. Um, okay, so they looked at some words, and here's what they found. They found that in typical texts, for the word I am, Nicol would write them as I am, I am, but Hodgson would say I am. Uh, I have would be written as I-V-E by Nicol, but A-V-E as Hodgson. For my and myself, Nicol would write my, myself, but Hodgson would write me and me-self. Uh, for am not, on the bottom right, Nickel would write apostrophe am not, and Hodgson would write ain't. 
Uh, here's an interesting one. This is very minor, but could be important. Uh, whenever you had the word to, like I'm going to someplace, uh, Nicole would write the word with to and then the word immediately after. But Hodgson would write word with the to and then a space and then the word after. So my question to you is based on the two texts above, were these texts written by Nicol or were they written by Hodgson? Just taking a look at how Nicol and Hodgson typically write texts from the chart below. And like, how do we know? Like which, which words are giving this away? Because this is something, yeah, both use av, both use av, A-V-E. Yeah, have to go, see ya, right there. A-V-E, have to go, have to go there. And we also see the space there. So let me actually get rid of the circles. You see the space there, have to go. And here's the thing, oh, both use, using me instead of my, yeah. Uh, Grassin me up. Well, okay, hold on. That's 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 normal English. Um, <laughs> uh, Chub with me dad. There's the one that's bad. This really should be my dad if it's Nicholson. Or sorry, if, if it's Nickel. Um, always in me room. I think there was a me self here too at some point. I think I read me self. Um, maybe I was imagining that. Anyways, but we have some evidence here. The, the space between av to go is also a big giveaway because Nicole would never do that. She'd just say av to go all in one character. So there's some good evidence here that these were actually written by Hodgson. And that's what forensic linguists found as well. They said these weren't written by her. Jenny Nicole was murdered before these texts were sent. Hodgson Hodgson killed her and sent these texts pretending to be her. And that is the result of the case. And then he was thrown in jail for the murder of Jenny Nichol. So uh, this is something that authorship attribution can be used for as well. And this isn't something that it takes like a, a very, you know, like a, a, a very deep linguist to do something like this. Um, it, it's when someone is very good at covering their tracks and you have to take a look at like complex sentence structure that a linguist is, is much more valuable for. But when you're just taking a look at individual words, I mean, this is something that we could do as long as we have enough time and, you know, we can sift through the data. Okay, any questions about authorship attribution until we get to our last topic, which is plagiarism? Oh yeah, there's M versus I am there too. Right there. That's a very Hodgson thing. Okay. So plagiarism, and we write borrowing here too, because sometimes there's some confusion between the two. Sometimes borrowing is plagiarism, and sometimes plagiarism is uh, misinterpreted borrowing. So here is William Shakespeare, the barge she sat in like a burnished throne burned on the water. Compared to The Wasteland by T.S. Eliot, the chair she sat in like a burnished throne glowed on the marble. So is this plagiarism, or was it simply a deliberate reference? Well, this was a problem to fans because 
This was in one of T.S. Eliot's books, The Wasteland, but it was not acknowledged as a reference. Uh, T.S. Eliot said that in this case, um, it was made out of respect. It was supposed to be a nice reference to one of William Shakespeare's great works, uh, sort of like a little Easter egg. Like, hey, like, I, I respect this guy. I'm going to put it in my book and just make a play on it. So uh, he, he eventually recovered from it with some fans, but there's always some fans out there who didn't like it because T.S. Eliot was known as a, as a plagiarist for doing this quite often, uh, using other people's words, changing them and not accrediting them in his work. So um, this story really isn't meant to be a judgment about T.S. Eliot or whether plagiarism is good or bad. Uh, quite frankly, I'm always on the fence about plagiarism. Uh, and, and the questions that I ask in this lecture and the questions that are asked in the legal system and in universities, I, I have the same questions in my head so we can talk about this. Um, should plagiarism be defined as unacknowledged borrowing, which is sort of what has happened here, or should it be defined as the product of an intention to deceive? In other words, should plagiarism require some deceptive intention with it? And this is always the question, like for instance, uh, when you're a student, right? And you have questions in a textbook and you go on Google and you find the instructor's solution manual to a textbook. And you make use of the instructor's solution manual and you submit your homework after using the instructor's solution manual. It's plagiarism, according to the university, but you're also doing what universities have told you to do, which is to make use of resources and online materials to finish your work. But you're not really trying to deceive people. You're just using the work without acknowledging it. You're not really trying to deceive your instructors. You're just using resources. Um, so of course I have to officially I stand with the university and say it's plagiarism, it's bad. Um, but internally, there's always some questions, right? So uh, plagiarism is a huge uh, offense in academia, of course, and usually this is where it is. It's in university where it's a huge deal. It doesn't matter when you do it, even as a professor, if you plagiarize, you can lose your PhD and your job immediately if you're caught. Um, whether it's a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, a PhD, if you plagiarize, you can just lose all your progress throughout all your years. Um, so here's what the University of Oregon has to say about plagiarism. Plagiarism is a form of cheating in which the student tries to pass off someone else's work as his or her own. Typically, substantial passages are lifted verbatim from a particular source without proper attribution having been made. Okay, there's a few things in here. So tries to pass off. Uh, substantial passages are lifted verbatim without proper attribution. Okay, so I guess I just wrote them down there as well. Um, so a couple of problems with this definition is that they say plagiarism is substantial verbatim borrowings, but usually when people plagiarize, it's not that. You don't copy and paste an entire paragraph. Usually what you do is you take the paragraph and you take some sentences and you change some words around, you edit it. That's not a substantial verbatim borrowing. You're taking the stuff and you're changing some stuff around. You're editing it. Um, two, a lot of it's not intentional, like I said. You're not intentionally trying to deceive us. Um, you're just making use of resources and you're altering it. So that way, you know, you're paying for a course. You're paying to get grades. You're trying to maximize your output and maximize the product that you receive. It's, university is a business. Let's, let's be real. It's a business. You're, you're paying for stuff. You want good grades. So you're just doing what you can. Um, so is this definition of plagiarism really good? And the answer is, well, probably not. The substantial verbatim borrowings isn't good in that case. Trying to pass off the work as their own is not good. So maybe linguistically, if we think about plagiarism, what we should be saying is that plagiarism 
is any work that you submit as a student that's not written in your own idiolect. And that when you borrow something from another author, it's not attributed. So um, it's written, you must write and submit work in your own idiolect and attribute any quotes or ideas to the authors that you borrowed them from. So this might be a better way linguistically of defining what plagiarism is and how you can submit something uh, that is like academically honest, something that is in your own words. So like, I, I, think, I think maybe this is a better way of describing like how to actually get around and how to develop a policy that is fair to students, that is understandable. Like, hey, when you submit something that is your own work, and you're not trying to steal from others, write it in your own style, in your own idiolect. Because idiolect covers your structures, uh, how you pick words, how you organize your thoughts. Um, it's, it's your style. Uh, so we just have three more slides here. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a five minute break because I need a five minute break and then we'll come back, finish the four slides and cover the test. I won't do a 10 minute break because we only have like another 20 minutes, um, but we'll do a five minute break and I'll finish up the forensic linguistics video that we started. So I'll see you in. Okay, so this slide takes a look at two texts with examples of some plagiarism. Now, what I want to demonstrate here is the differences and how obvious a case of plagiarism can be. Um, so here's the first text, and I won't read these out. Um, but what I've done is I've highlighted the phrases and words that have been clearly copied from text one. So text one is the original. In text two, uh, we can see all of the copied sentences from text one. They are in red and we see some changes. And uh, there's quite, uh, I mean, there's not many changes. Uh, but in text three, this is a little bit more questionable because if we think about uh, how much has been changed? Well, there's a lot that's been changed. But when we take a look at the words that have been added, well, it is very, so it is essential for all teachers to understand the history of Britain has been changed to, it is very important for us as educators to realize that Britain. So really all that's been changed are the words themselves, but not the idea, not the structure. Um, uh, clearly, it is vital for teachers and associate teachers to ensure that popular myths and stereotypes held by the wider community do not influence their teaching compared to teachers like anyone else can be influenced by age old myths and beliefs. Um, it's a very roundabout way of saying the same thing. But it is questionable. Uh, it, it's, it's not an obvious case of plagiarism like two. So some people might catch it and claim, hey, that's plagiarism. And others might say, uh, this, is, this is just patch writing. It's, it, it's fine. So let's take a look at a study about plagiarism to see, you know, if we're not going to take a look at just verbatim plagiarizing, what should we look for if we're just taking a look at like general words and stuff to see, well, if we have some some text and we're not taking a look at the actual sentences that are written, but if we're just taking a look at the content and and individual word tokens and types, uh, what what patterns would we find? So this study was done in 1997. There have been a lot of studies that have been done since, uh, but this is just a nice a nice simple one. So uh, first of all, 
we don't look at words like grammatical function words like uh, the, in, on, and, and so on. What we do is we just look at lexical words. So these are these are content words. So these are our our nouns, our verbs, our adjectives, and our adverbs. And we distinguish these as tokens and types. So tokens are just how many times a word appears. So tokens are like you look at every single word in the sentence and then you add that as like a token. So Charlie is a token, likes is a token, green is a token, ducks is a token, and is a token, green is a token, pigs is a token. Like each word is a token. Um, lexical type is like the word itself, whether it appears or not. It's not how many times it appears. It's just whether the word appears in the sentence at all or not. So for example, when we think about the lexical type, we could think about the lexical type of the word green. So the type green occurs in the sentence. So yeah, so green is a type that occurs, but green is also a token. So green, the token occurs twice. So, so you can think of types as being like, yes or no, is it in there, is it not? And the tokens is like how many times? So that's that's the distinction that we're going to make. So if you just take a look at all essays, like a standard essay, um, and in this case, it was it was a one page essay. Uh, sorry, it was, it was a one a one paragraph essay. It was very, very short. So let, let me let me write this down. Just so it was very clear. Um, this was a one paragraph essay. If you even want to call it an essay, just a one paragraph of writing. Uh, they found that the average essay shared 13 lexical types and 20% of all lexical tokens. So on average, there's about a 20% overlap between uh, non-plagiarized works. So if you go to turn it in and you get a score back, if you're good, you know, you're looking at a score less than about 25% match. A normal person will get about a 25% match on their work. That's, that's okay. Um, but for plagiarized essays, they share a lot more. So they share about 72 lexical types or about 60% of all lexical tokens. So this is when that turn it in mark comes back and it's like, hey, over half of your essay is plagiarized. And this is a pretty good indication that your work has been plagiarized. So a big difference between say uh, a 20% on the bar to a 60% on the bar. And, and this is just suspected. There's always a chance that you just happen to have the same writing style and same thoughts and ideas as someone else who has written an essay before. That is always a possibility. And it's always the work of an instructor or whoever is looking at your work to make sure that it is plagiarized or not and to investigate. Uh, but these sort of preliminary tools can be used to investigate and to sort of uh, make it easier to, to sift through and check to see whether something is plagiarized or not. So uh, that's one of the studies that has been done in the past to, to find some patterns in plagiarized works. So this doesn't even take into account sentence structure. This is just looking at words in writing. And here's the final fact of our course a very nice and simple fact and that is the longer a sentence is the easier it's going to be to detect plagiarism and this is like it's just, just common sense but it's a nice fact to end the course with and i did this google search yesterday so i typed in i asked in quotation marks see how many occurrences it came back and i made the sentence longer and longer until i got no matches so 
the more words you add to a sentence, the fewer results there are. So if I'm going to steal a sentence and I say, I asked her if I could, it's going to be a little bit harder to find a match because there's 4 million search results. But if I'm going to borrow the sentence, I asked her if I could carry her bags, there's only 3,000 matches. It's going to be a little bit easier to find that plagiarism uh, if that's the sentence you borrowed. Now, if you're taking, I asked her if I could carry her bags too, uh, this now has zero matches on Google. Of course, there's other ways that we can search for plagiarism. There's different search engines. Uh, we could always use Bing. Maybe Bing will come up with something. Um, who knows? Uh, but this isn't too scary. What's really good is when you can find something that is in like the one to 10 range. If you can find a search with only one to 10 results, uh, that's how you can catch plagiarism very, very easily. Uh, because then we know exactly where you got it from and there's not too many sources. So um, if you're going to search to see if someone has plagiarized something from an essay, uh, what we usually do, uh, so here's a little bit of advice, and this is usually what you can check to see. Uh, to find plagiarism, uh, take a sentence from an essay that is 10 to 14 words long and put it in quotation marks and Google it. Uh, usually 10 to 14 words is about the nice length on Google where you can find a specific result without being too specific. Uh, 10 to 14 words is also the length that students will not edit their work. They'll just take a 10 word sentence because it's long enough that they think it doesn't need to be edited. Um, because when it gets too long, of course, you paraphrase. Uh, when it's short enough, you keep it. But when it's short enough, uh, there's not, of course, it's not easy to find when it's really short, right? Like it's a six word sentence. How are you going to find where it's taken from? 10 to 14 words is sort of the sweet spot. So I'm sort of giving you our, my little tricks I use, but uh, anyways, this is how we detect plagiarism. And uh, what I should say is I haven't really been focusing on the computational aspects in this side because we talked about computational linguistics last week, uh, but a lot of the tools that they use um, for doing this stuff, uh, like part of speech taggers and stuff like that, those can be employed for doing this sort of work. Um, even just extracting tokens and then comparing tokens, uh, a lot of the tools we looked at last week can be done. Uh, do I have thoughts on Turnitin scores? Uh, Turnitin is a tool. Uh, and I think that people need to remember that when they use Turnitin, it is a tool. Uh, it is not something that determines whether a student has plagiarized or not. It is a tool that provides feedback on the likelihood of plagiarism. So when you receive a score back as an instructor that says the student has a 60% match rating, that doesn't mean that the student has plagiarized. What that means is that it is time to investigate and see whether or not the student has plagiarized. Um, because a student with a 20% score can plagiarize as well. Um, and, and that's the thing, right? Uh, students who are really good with plagiarism know how to patch write. Uh, and patch writing is basically the process of having like uh, these these sort of pre-written formats, these these templates that they put certain ideas into, um, and then just pump out essays really quickly through that, uh, which is another form of plagiarism. And those won't be caught by Turnitin scores. So. Relying completely on Turnitin is not the best way to catch plagiarism. And I think it's also a very unfair uh, tool to students because it just makes them, uh, it just makes them like almost afraid, right? When you have to submit something into Turnitin, you, you, you get this fear like, oh no, this number is going to come back and it's going to say I'm plagiarized even though I didn't. I have people ever plagiarized by accident. Yeah, all the time. All the time. Uh, people forget to put a quote on an author or to quote um, something, some idea they've taken. Sometimes they use an idea by someone famous that they came up with on their own and they didn't know that someone else came up with it before. 
and it's plagiarism because they didn't quote the person who came up with it, even though it's not their fault that they've never heard of it before. But because it's so well known in the community that a professor is familiar with, um, it's considered plagiarism. Uh, how do universities handle it? Well, like humans, uh, you hope that the professor is understanding and that they understand that you as a student didn't know who it was and that was your idea and then uh, they let you revise it or add the quote in and quote the work. Um, How informative can token, how can, can counting tokens of individual words in a text be? I'm wondering because the last slide said suspected plagiarism, not actual plagiarism. Can't text have a similar vocabulary, but use it differently? Yes. So um, that's what I mean uh, when I say like, uh, these tools are not meant to be uh, decisive about whether it is plagiarism or not, but rather like, um, uh, pieces of information that can be used to help people to, uh, to, to help instructors decide whether further investigation is needed. So we can say that there are trends that when 60% of all lexical tokens are shared, there's suspected plagiarism there. So then we use further investigation. Um, the thing is, is that if you're comparing it just within all the written essays in a class and you give some prompt that say i want you to talk about uh, myths beliefs and multiculturalism obviously those words are going to come up in everyone's essay and obviously related words are going to come up in everyone's essay so there's going to be a lot of overlap and you need to make a judgment and say okay obviously we're expecting 30 percent overlap so you need to make your own threshold for how much overlap is going to be like suspected plagiarism. Yeah. So like th these aren't just, um, yeah, like these are, these are just general trends and these are supposed to inform people, but uh, like all tools, you have to have a brain behind the tool in order to make use of the tool. It's like you give someone a hammer and a nail if they don't know how to use it. Like, what are they going to do with it? <laughs> Same thing with this. Some people will use it improperly, and, and, we, and we do see that. We do see people using tools like Turnitin improperly, and that negatively affects uh, students. So uh, how do you become a forensic linguist if you are interested in this stuff? Uh, the good thing is that you can get a bachelor's degree in pretty much anything and you can still become a forensic linguist. Uh, you just need to get a graduate degree in forensic linguistics or in a related discipline, something in law. And there's not too many forensic linguistic graduate programs out there. Some forensic linguistics uh, programs are actually programs in forensic speech sciences, which is a lot more common. And usually you have like a lot of different courses. So some courses in law, psychology, linguistics, computing science, um, and uh, you can be hired as a consultant or you can work in government or um, you can also just work as a lawyer. You can become a lawyer and go into law. So it depends what you wanna do. Again, it's just the same as any other grad program. Uh, it's gonna be a lot of work, but uh, the nice thing is that really any undergraduate degree, you can do it because it's really just about critical thinking. Uh, any any sort of law degree, whatever undergraduate degree you have is fine. You just need to have critical thinking skills and writing skills. And any undergraduate program will prepare you for that. So there's an example graduate program if you're interested that you want to click on. I won't go into it. Uh, the average salary seems to be about 70,000 US a year, which isn't too bad. Um, I'm sure that will go up as time goes on. Uh, what does that like? 85,000 Canadian or something. That's not too bad. But that is it for forensic linguistics. Are there any questions before we talk about the third test guide?
Okay, so this is up on Canvas now. Uh, this final test is 15%. It's very similar to the first one, but there are some time adjustments that I'll talk about. So this covers just sociolinguistics, computational linguistics, and forensic linguistics. So just the last three lectures on uh, language use and applications. Uh, you have between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. as always. Um, it's the same distribution as the first test. So 20 multiple choice, multiple answer, or drop down questions, and 10 from short answer. We'll make the same adjustments. So at least two thirds of the questions will be multiple choice. Uh, then the remaining one third will be multiple answer, multiple drop down menu. Uh, there was a request in the last one to specify whether the question was multiple answer or multiple choice. So I'm just going to write at the top of every question. If it's multiple answer, I'll just put multiple answer in red text, just so you know, and it's clear. I know the boxes are like boxes versus circles, but um, for some people that wasn't enough. So I'll just make that clear. Uh, for time limits, uh, I like the time for the last one. So I've decided we're going to do uh, 50 minutes for the multiple choice. So it's only 20 questions, but that gives you two and a half minutes per question. So it's the last one, why not? And 45 minutes for the short answer. So uh, that's two and a half minutes per point for multiple choice, and that's one and a half minutes per point for short answer. So it's, I think it's going to be the most time out of uh, per point for both tests, but that's okay. I think giving more time is better, and we don't really have any um, content for next week. So we can use most of the three hours for the test. Uh, same rule as always. Uh, Here is the content. So this is on Canvas, so don't worry about writing any of this stuff down. Uh, let me put myself here. Uh, sociolinguistics is eight points for multiple choice, three points for short answer. Uh, for the short answer, you're going to do something similar to the sociolinguistics question on the assignment. So similar to question, oh, this says two and four. This should be question three and four. I need to make an adjustment there. Um, you'll have to talk about which sounds have changed for a Creole and uh, which translation of a word is appropriate. Uh, Vasundra's lecture is part of the computational linguistics lecture. So it is part of that lecture in the last hour on the lecture recordings. Uh, so that'll be three points. So I'll give you a few words. I'll ask you which sounds have changed. And instead of you having to come up with a transcription completely on your own, I'm going to give you a list, like two, three, or four choices of how a word should be transcribed or could be transcribed. And you just have to pick the best one out of the list and justify your answer. So like in this one, you had to translate my name on the assignment on your own from scratch. On the short answer version, I'll give you like four options. You have to pick one and tell me why. So a little bit more straightforward for what you have to do for time's sake. Um, so the reasoning is going to be what's important. Uh, for computational linguistics, you're going to have to do like a sentiment analysis thing. So this will be similar to the demonstration on slide 22. So take a look at that. Uh, you'll basically have to analyze the same sentence twice. I'll give you a sentence. I'll tell you what the values of individual words are and how to deal with things like very and slightly and tell you two different ways for how to deal with it. So whether you're doing it word by word or whether you're incorporating small phrases into it, you give me the value of the sentence and then you tell me which method is better and why. So you can check slide 22 for that and review the lecture uh, videos if you want an explanation. Um, and then for today's lecture, normally I don't put a written question on for the material that we do in the week before the test, because I like to have a written question on the assignment first. Um, but because it's the final week in the course and we won't have an assignment, I am doing a written question on forensic linguistics. So what we're going to do is something similar to what we did on slide 17, which is the Jenny Nickel case. I'm going to give you three texts. I'm going to give you a short text written by suspect A, a short text written by suspect B, and I'm going to give you a ransom note. And what your job is to do is to figure out whether the ransom note is written by suspect A or suspect B by analyzing the language in the text. So um, taking a look at how words are spelled or the word choices and justifying your answer. 
So you don't need to know anything about like advanced syntax structure. I'm going to try to keep it similar to like how the text was done on this. So I'm not going to give you a chart of how like how each person writes the words. That's sort of your job to figure out like in text A is the person writing I am is like I'm or I am and so on. And then you just have to take a look at the ransom note and say, well, which which uh, this ransom note, does it look more like suspects A writing or suspect B's writing and why? So um, well, in my opinion, I think that's kind of a fun question, but I, I know what it's like writing a test. It's, it's not always fun on your end, but a nice little way to wrap up the course and pretty applicable in terms of forensic linguistics because that's something that a forensic linguist would actually do. But of course, not a real murder case because it's just a course. Um, and then, of course, the rest is multiple choice, multiple answer. So, um, so to read a, a ransom text to analyze, then compare to sus A, sus B, and choose one person justify. Yeah, so you analyze a ransom text, and based on the words, how they're written, you're going to say whether it's like suspect A or suspect B, and just tell me why you've chosen the one that you've chosen. And, and you'll specify like based on this word, suspect A writes it like this and suspect B writes it like this and this word. So I'll, I'll be specific with how many things you should point out. Investigate the murder of your GPA. Unfortunately, that seems like it's non-linguistic. <laughs> oh. Okay, um, are there any questions about test three coming up? Uh, or are there any questions about assignment three, which is due tonight? I'm also happy to take any questions about that at this point. Last minute questions are fine. Oh, yeah, uh, right. I didn't talk about what lecture is next week. Um, there is a totally optional lecture after the test next week because we're done with course content. Um, if you're curious about other courses in the linguistics department and curious about the stuff we learned in this course and what you can do with it in the linguistics department, I'll be talking about some of the other courses in linguistics uh, after the test next week. So if you're curious about linguistics minor, linguistics major, just looking for other electives, um, we'll talk about that at 420. Um, other than that, though, uh, this will be the final lecture. So, um, yeah, that's it for the course. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, feel free to hang out next week, but if not, I understand. And uh, I hope this has been a nice little introduction to linguistics in a very non non theoretical way. A nice little overview of all the different fields that is not too intensive in terms of like the actual components of language, but rather like how people use it, what language is, how things go on in the brain, and just a nice general understanding of, of what language is. I know it's, it's, it's a very broad course with a lot of information, and there's always some aspects that, that aren't interesting and some aspects that are interesting. Like I much prefer the first third of the course and the last third of the course. The, the middle third of the course is, is not my favorite but uh, it's all interesting to me and we all have our own preferences but uh it's 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 been a fun course and thanks for hanging out all these weeks so yeah if you come out to the optional lecture next week i'll see you there um if not good luck studying and i'm happy to answer your questions over email or in office hours or in appointments and uh yeah good luck Oh. oh, there is a question for the assignment. Let me, uh, yeah, sure, let me. Let me ruin the sen this sentimental moment by answering this question about the assignment, which is just my style because I can't handle the sentiment anymore. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Any question regarding your name for the assignment? Okay.
So for my name on the assignment, um, there are two things that are probably difficult about it. Uh, well, three things. Uh, one is the V, in which case I gave you a hint, which is think about where the sound is made in the mouth and a sound that's similar to it. Uh, the other thing is how to deal with this TR. And I recommend with this, you think about what is happening with the word broken. Because what is happening with the BR cluster is going to be the same thing that happens with the TR cluster. Um, the third thing that there is, is what does T go to? <laughs> Because Hawaiian doesn't have a T. And the third hint I'll give here for T, for anyone sticking around, is much like the V, where we think that V goes to something similar in the mouth. We should ask ourselves, what do similar sounds to T go to? So when we think about the mouth and think about the T sound, there are other sounds in the mouth that are very similar to T that are made in the same spot, like T, D, S, Z. Uh, so if you know what one of these sounds goes to, or what one of those sounds changes to, it doesn't change to me, uh, then you can figure out what T changes to. So that's just a little hint about how to figure out T. Uh, and in terms of the vowels, it doesn't matter which vowels you pick. Just pick whatever sounds nice. I told the TA is not to, not to care about vowel choice. So yeah, so you'll have to check the, the chart to figure out one of these ones. How much detail do we have to go into in describing the chatbots? Um... Not too much detail. You can answer all those questions in less than like three sentences. Uh, so let, let, let me pull up the actual question itself so I know, ex so I remember exactly what I'm asking you to do. Um, just so I know how it's phrased. So when you say like, how does Eliza respond to questions about herself? How does she respond to facts about yourself? Does she respond like a normal human? Um, you could answer each of those in like one sentence. That would be fine. Uh, does Eliza have seem to have a specialty for types of questions she can answer? Do you think she was programmed to respond to specific prompts or to adapt and learn? You could answer each of those in like one sentence. That would be okay. I don't need a lot of detail for these. Each of those are just one point. Each question. Enjoy your week, everyone. Um, for processing times, you want us to choose the at the pronoun times and after the pronoun times. For processing times, you should consider both. Um, so both at the pronoun and after the pronoun should be considered. So if it's like normal, normal, that means it's like perfect. If it's normal, slow, then there's some troubles. If it's slow, slow, then it's pretty bad. Sorry, and when I mean, when I mean like, or when I say normal, normal, I mean normal, 
at pronoun, normal after pronoun, that's good. Normal at pronoun, slow after, that's kind of bad. Slow at pronoun, slow after, that's pretty bad. There are no cases where it's slow at the pronoun and normal after. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, that's, that's just not something that happens in, uh, in pronoun processing. The, the 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 recovery time for for humans just isn't that fast when they read uh, just to be extra sure normal normal is considered best case while all the others means it's having something wrong right yeah if there's normal reading times that means that people read it and they're not having issues with it when people slow down that means that they're thinking about it because something has gone wrong they're they're reading the words or reading the phrases and they're having to think about it because they're trying to make a connection in their head that just isn't working for them like they might read the word secretary then they see the word he and they're like who is he and that's why there's a slowdown or they read secretary and they read they and they're like hold on who is they is they secretary or is they someone else and that's why there's this slowdown So yeah, normal, normal is definitely the best case. 